Welcome to this OCS highlights video. If you're preparing for your operational case study exam, then this is the perfect video for you. You might be wondering what you need to do between now and the exam date. Well, the best place to start is by gaining a thorough understanding of the pre-scene company. And in this video, we'll be showing you some of the highlights from the Estranti pre-scene analysis pack. And these highlights will give you a good overview of the pre-scene and should serve as a solid basis for your preparation over the next few weeks. So in this video, we'll be showing you clips from five different videos from our pre-scene analysis pack. And the first clip is from the pre-scene analysis series. It's vital that you fully analyze your pre-scene, and this requires a detailed examination of the case study, ensuring that every section is fully understood. So our pre-scene analysis video provides a page-by-page -page analysis of every section of the pre-scene, and it ensures you don't miss anything important, and it helps you to build a comprehensive understanding of the material. And this is vital if you're going to gain high marks in the exam. So in this clip, we've taken a section from our pre-scene analysis video series. Okay, let's keep going then. Let's move on to actually look at some information about the company. So we'll look at the company background. Now, back office is the name of the company. Uh, for the rest of the video series, rather than saying back office every time, I may just start referring to them as BO. Um, but so BO is a company that designs, manufactures and markets backpacks that serve as an alternative to the traditional briefcase. Okay, and it goes on to tell us that the backpacks are built to a high specification and they're aimed at the growing market of hybrid workers, hybrid workers being those that work from home and the office and they need a portable container. So rather than reading through all the precinct for you, like I said, hopefully you've already read it. So let's just pick out the key points and analysis. So first of all, what the company does, it's high quality alternative to a briefcase and it's specifically targeted at hybrid workers. So by positioning their backpacks as a stylish alternative to a traditional briefcase, BO is directly targeting professionals who need both function and form and especially hybrid workers. And this market segment is looking for products that can bridge the gap between personal and professional life. And that is exactly what back office delivers. However, relying on a niche audience, that does mean that the company needs to constantly innovate and as more competitors enter into the market, staying ahead with design and features that cater to evolving work environments, that's going to be critical. We also learn that Back Office is a high value brand and that is reflected in relatively high selling prices compared to other brands. So we've got a company here that's using premium pricing and that has to be justified by quality and innovation. And the pricing strategy, then positioning it to the company as a high value brand with premium pricing, that comes with the expectation of high quality and innovation. So if customers are going to pay more, they need to feel like they're getting something unique, whether that's in the design, in the durability, or in the added functionality. And the challenge will be ensuring that every product justifies its price point, particularly as competitors could undercut with lower priced alternatives. So the focus for BO will be on making sure that their brand promise holds strong in the minds of their customers. So the company sells its products through a website. So we're introducing the idea that the company's going to have to manage its website and it's going to have to, uh, its sales, it's one of its distribution channels will be through its website, how it manages all of that, and also selected retail stores. Now we're going to come back to this more a little bit later on, but it's still important to note now that this is the two kind of core channels for them. Their own website, which introduces a need to manage a website, 
and to manage all the back end of the website to make sure sales can go through electronic payments all that kind of stuff and also through retail stores so they're going to have to man ma manage ma um, sorry uh, manage and maintain relationships with retailers typically you offering your products at a discount to retailers so that the retailer can make some kind of margin uh, how you get your products out to those retail stores whether they're based all over the country whether they're based beyond the country as well so like i said we'll get more into that later on just note that for now the country is based based in h land or land we'll call it h land and that's a country in western europe so although h land doesn't really exist maybe it's based on holland um western europe does exist so that gives us a bit of real world grounding and it uses the h dollar as its currency again we, we have no uh, idea of the exchange value of the h dollar uh, but generally in these pre-scenes the currency is is modeled on somewhere between a dollar a pound and a euro so it will be roughly in that kind of area so moving on to the next section back office was founded in 2015 so it's a fairly new company so just under 10 years old by arlo james arlo is a product designer and was previously employed as chief designer for the leading hiking backpack brand okay and arlo became an expert in ergonomic backpack design technical textiles and the backpack manufacturing process and that expertise um, were transferred when he started back office so what we have here then is we've got a founder who has a deep knowledge of ergonomic design and technical textiles and that is the foundation of back office's competitive edge and Arlo's expertise in creating products that blend comfort with practicality gives the brand a strong differentiator in the market but as BO scales and grows the challenge is going to be how do they institutionalize that expertise so it's not just all based in one person but it just becomes part of the ethos and culture of the company the brand can't rely solely on arlo's expertise and knowledge and his vision it needs to build a design culture within the company that can continue innovating without depending just on one Person. and that's going to be crucial for long-term growth and sustaining their design leadership and actually as a brief aside it's worth noting that lots of successful companies are deeply influenced by the background of their founders so just like we can see with Arlo who brought his expertise into ergonomic design from the hiking backpack world and you brought that to back office you have famous company founders like Steve Jobs at Apple or Jeff Bezos at Amazon they use their unique experiences to shape their brands so Arlo's decision to focus on both functionality and style has made back office backpacks stand out in a crowded market and that blend of design expertise and practical application is something you see in companies that disrupt their industries okay so moving on to the next paragraph then this is where we learn a bit about h land so it's a country has an influential fashion industry and a history of textile manufacturing um basically the um when arlo founded back office he wanted to have in-house manufacturing in h land which at the time was considered unusual and risky because most companies outsource the manufacturing to specialist companies in asia so what we have then is a company that has committed to local production and by keeping production in h land this has undeniably helped reinforce the company's high-end brand image and it's tapping into the company's reputation for quality craftsmanship and it's, it's you can think of it as a strategic move and it strengthens the premium perception of the brand but with that comes higher production costs compared to outsourcing uh, to uh, specialist manufacturers in Asia as much of the uh, competition does. 
So the real challenge is going to be how do we find ways to manage these costs as the company scales? Can they improve production efficiencies while keeping the made in H land quality intact? That's going to be crucial in maintaining profitability as they grow. Okay, so that's the that's the key message from that paragraph. If we continue on, we learn a bit about the brand launch and how that was managed by an external marketing company. But most importantly, it was phenomenally successful. So we learn in this paragraph that the brand launch was a real home run, largely thanks to the external marketing company's efforts to position BO as a luxury brand. And they capitalized on exposure in fashion magazines and celebrity endorsements to create a buzz. But maintaining that momentum will be crucial. So while the initial push got them on the radar, BO needs to invest in long term brand building strategies and they can't rely forever on external buzz. They need solid ongoing marketing plans to keep their brand relevant and desirable. Also in this paragraph related to marketing and, and brand value, we learned that the brand really took off when an A-list actor, um, almost famous, also famous as Goodwill Ambassador for Humanitarian Aid Agencies, was photographed using a backpack office backpack on numerous occasions. So this celebrity endorsement, that's a game changer for a company like this. This is what will have shot BO into the spotlight and boosted demand practically overnight. But there is a risk in relying too much on celebrity influence. What happens when trends shift or maybe if the celebrity's image no longer aligns with the brand? BO needs to make sure that its value proposition isn't tied solely to external figures. And building a strong brand identity that stands on its own beyond celebrity endorsements will help to safeguard the brand in the long run. Next up, we've got a clip from our strategic analysis. It's extremely important that you have the ability to identify how the pre-scene relates to key models and theory from E3, F3 and P3. And the examiners will expect students to demonstrate a good understanding of the models and theories and make the appropriate links to the case study during the exam. It can be hard to fully analyze a company using models you've only recently learned and be confident that you've got it right. So our strategic analysis has done that hard work for you. So in this clip, we're going to take a look at our strategic analysis video. So let's crack on and look at where the organization is heading. We're going to start by considering the company's mission. And to do that, we'll look at its purpose, strategy, values and policies. And where those aren't explicitly stated, we can infer them from the pre-scene. And we are given a bit of information about the company's sort of mission and vision. So let's summarize that and understand. So the purpose, why the organization exists. For whom does it exist? Well, the purpose, I think, for back office is pretty clear. It's to create backpacks that blend premium design with functionality for the growing hybrid workforce. And that's a unique market, a niche, and it allows the company to stand out by offering that high quality product that caters to the particular needs of these professionals who work from multiple locations. So when it comes to the strategy, what will it do to compete? Again, this centers around maintaining premium standards, and that's supported by in-house manufacturing in H-Land, which is an uncommon choice in manufacturing, but it is a strategic choice to have that control over manufacturing, to keep the quality high, and to build into the brand that historic, his, the history of manufacturing in H-Land. So by not outsourcing, back office is maintaining full control and making sure that quality and sustainability remain at the forefront. Okay, and values, that's what the organization stands for. Okay, so whether that's quality, value for money, innovation, etc. So when it comes to values for back office, we know they put quality, innovation, and sustainability at the heart of everything they do. Ethical sourcing, 
a commitment to reducing their carbon footprint, their core to the brand. And those are going to be reflected in organizational policies at the bottom. And these are things that ensure that people act in accordance with the defined value strategy and purpose. So we aren't really given any policies. We know the company have got targets around uh, being carbon neutral, etc. Okay, and so any policies that the company have will be focused on these things. So policies around green credentials, ethical sourcing, and sustainability in the supply chain. So next up, we need to consider objectives and performance measurement. So objectives will be the focus target for the company to move towards, um, perhaps over a 12 month period. So taking key parts from the mission, the values, the strategy, turning those into tangible objectives, maybe over three months, over 12 months, that the company is moving towards. This helps to motivate staff and importantly, it enables performance measurement. So you can see where you have uh, progressed, how much, how close you have come to meeting your objectives. And also we can think here about what performance measurements, key performance indicators we might have to measure our progress on particular objectives. So some of the inferred objectives from the case Okay, so three here. First of all, expanding market share in the hybrid worker segment, uh, maintaining product innovation um, in, with design and sustainable materials, and also sustaining profitability while maintaining premium brand positioning. And these objectives then would align with the company's strategy of being a leader in premium office backpacks and it ensures, ensures that their products are at the cutting edge of both design and and sustainability. So thinking about measuring performance and potential key performance indicators, we've got a number of relevant KPIs here that might help us measure performance against these objectives. So some that would help track would be, um, you could look at sales growth across major markets like Europe and Asia, where they've been building a presence. Profitability is also crucial, particularly in maintaining the premium price point that sets them apart from competitors. So that's where profit margins and return on investment would come in. Sustainability KPIs like tracking the use of recycled materials or reducing the carbon footprint. That's going to be essential for maintaining brand integrity. And lastly, KPIs for customer satisfaction and product quality, especially given their high price point, will ensure they keep their premium image intact. Okay. And then next, we're going to think about critical success factors. So all of this is kind of filtering down. So you start with the mission, vision, moving down to objectives and performance measurement. Now we're moving down to critical success factors and critical success factors should be informed by and in alignment with a company's strategy. And these are the things an organization must do well in order to succeed. And the flip side of that is to think, well, if a company would fail to do these things, not to do these things sufficiently or adequately, then that could well lead towards their ultimate failure. So it's really important that a critical success factor is first of all identified, so it can be really focused on and prioritized, and it can be used in decision making, and to ensure that it remains a strength for the business and isn't overlooked. Now, uh, in broader terms, if a company is considering new strategies, product development, expanding into new markets, whatever it might be, they should be consistent with the company's critical success factors. And so that's something to keep in mind because if something isn't, so for example, if the company were to outsource their manufacturing to Asia um, for uh, low, low cost manufacturing, that is not consistent with their strategy. It wouldn't be consistent with their critical success factors. So that wouldn't be a very good um, strategic move for the company. And so although you won't necessarily necessarily be uh, evaluating strategic decisions in this exam, um, that is something that you could pepper in to your solutions and answers to show that you understand um, the importance, the, the, the critical success factors for the company. So the following are the critical success factors that I've identified for the company. 
So first up, we've got an efficient supply chain. So behind the scenes, an efficient supply chain is crucial, particularly with their in-house production model in HLAND. And reliable sourcing of materials and maintaining high production standards are going to be key to ensuring that they meet market demand. Next, we have sustainability leadership. And this is central to the company's brand. So they really need to maintain leadership in this area, especially as they use recycled PET, or that's proposed for one of the new product launches, and a push towards carbon neutrality by 2030. Strong financial management is going to be important, especially as they expand their product range and reach new markets, so balancing costs while, while maintaining premium pricing is going to be critical. Product innovation is important for this company. Several factors will determine whether the company continues to succeed in its market. Product innovation is a critical success factor. The company needs to lead with cutting edge design, new features like the RFID pockets and integrated USB ports that differentiate their products from competitors. We know the company's got four new product launches uh, anticipated for 2025. And then another one here is brand recognition and brand loyalty. So this is another vital factor and they need to maintain that premium image. They need to offer products that deliver real value so they can secure repeat customers and build a loyal client base. We're casting the net a little bit wider now with a look at the wider industry in which the pre-scene company operates with our industry analysis video. It is critical to demonstrate to the examiner that you have fully understood the pre-seen industry as a key element to gaining extra high marks in your case study exam. Researching the industry can be a laborious process, especially when you're not sure which information is useful and which isn't. And our team has spent hours doing this research for you, finding the information that will help you to achieve a wider perspective of the industry and build a deeper knowledge in preparation for your exam. So in this next clip, we'll be taking a look at our industry analysis video. So the examiners expect you to have excellent knowledge of the pre-seen industry. So that involves an excellent knowledge of back office and the industry that it operates in as well. So this is designed to test your ability to apply theoretical SEMA knowledge to real world concepts. It's vital that you have a good understanding of the industry to give back office any kind of sound industry advice. And by providing that sound industry advice, you can maximize your marks. Let's look at your role a little closely. So you're a finance officer working within the finance department of back office. With an understanding of your role as a finance officer, you need to have an involvement in managing the account information and providing information to assist with the planning and decision making. In this decision making process, it's vital that you understand the industry that back office operates in so that you know the kinds of decisions that the different companies or real world companies are making. So with an understanding of what's expected of you, here's where Astranti can help. So, one way of maximizing your marks, according to the examiner's report, is having a sound knowledge of the relevant industry that it's in and demonstrating this knowledge throughout. So here's where we can help you at Astranti. With the masses of information found online, we've sifted through and gathered all of the relevant details, companies and strategies to ensure that you'll be well equipped for your exam. This saves you time sifting through the masses of information yourself so you can focus on building your knowledge and building your understanding of what SEMA expects of you. So let's look more closely at back office and the smart backpack industry together. Let's start with an introduction to the smart backpack industry. So what is a smart backpack? A smart backpack represents a convergence of technology, fashion and functionality, driven by an increasing need for convenience and connectivity. And so, as the world became increasingly reliant on mobile devices like smartphones, tablets and laptops, remote work and travel became more commonplace. 
And this is where the smart backpack really began to find its market. So in the first wave of smart backpacks, they combined the basic functionality of a traditional backpack with integrated USB charging ports with it ports for things like phones and uh, tablets as well. So companies like Tilt and Ghost Tech, real world companies, were among the pioneers of these original bags. And their unique selling points were that the backpacks not only carried your technology, but could keep it charged as well. Then we see a shift towards durability and multifunctionality. So this is where a market for a hybrid workforce comes in. Consumers are looking for a durable and multifunctional bag that they can take their office equipment to and from work in. So brands tended to incorporate waterproof materials, anti-theft mechanisms and reinforced compartments to protect work laptops and other sensitive electronics as people are carrying it to and from the office to work both in the office and from home a few days a week. So, companies like Nordis, Samsonite and Targus emerged as leaders in this space, taking over Ghost Tech and Tilt, who were the pioneers. Unfortunately, Ghost Tech and Tilt didn't tend to diversify their products and so opened up the market for Nodis, Nodis, Samsonite and Targus. So whether it was intended to or not, these backpacks in offering both durability and sophistication opened themselves up to a new market of the tech savvy. Despite emerging in the early 2010s, it truly came into its own during the late 2010s and early 2020s a period marked by increasing flexibility of work arrangements. Due to things like COVID and developments in technology, more professionals adopted hybrid work approaches, time where they spend some time at home and some time in the office. Due to this, the smart backpack industry evolved to include even more advanced features, some of which include solar panels, for sustainable charging and Arvid blocking pockets to protect against digital theft. Emerging simultaneously alongside this market the rise of eco-friendly materials as people are opting more for sustainability. Now as we look ahead at the smart backpack industry we understand that it needs to take a significant role in the future of work and travel in order to succeed. It needs to cater to the needs of a workforce that's more mobile and connected than ever before. And it needs to cater to eco-friendly targets that are set by its consumers. Before we look at the industry life cycle of the smart backpack, it's important to note just how young the backpack industry is. So it emerged in 2010 as a niche market that targeted tech enthusiasts and frequent travelers. Market awareness was low, and early companies like Tilt and Ghost Tech focused, focused on experimenting with designs to fit the right fit for customers. The next clip is taken from one of our most popular videos, the Top 10 Issues. The Top 10 Issues video identifies the 10 most likely issues to appear in the exam based on our expertise and experience in this area and our SES expert gives guidance on how to deal with the issues in your answers, provides advice on which models to use and key points that you should raise. Based on our experience of analysing SEMA case studies for over 10 years, our predictions have been extremely accurate in previous exams with around 70 to 80% of topics in the real exams being covered in our top 10 lists. So take a look now at this clip from our top 10 issues video. So what we've got then, we're going to go through these 10 issues. They are numbered, but they're not in any particular priority. So number one is no more likely to come up than number 10. These are just the 10 different issues that I think are going to come up. So let's get into it then and start with our first five, 10 through to six. So number 10 is financial reporting. 
So the basis of choice here, first of all, key F1 syllabus area. In fact, it's most of the F1 syllabus, isn't it? Applying accounting standards. It's always examined. You don't see a variant come up that doesn't have financial reporting in it, which gives us a broad, uh, fairly broad scope. So let's make it a bit more specific. So normally the kind of things that come up and the things relevant to a company like back office, which is a manufacturing company, asset purchases or disposals, okay, particularly disposals, um, uh, particularly if that's going through IFRS 5, um, assets held for sale or discontinued operations. So that's one that comes up. So knowing how to apply the provisions of that standard, important. Machinery upgrades, capital expenditure on improving machinery, fixing machinery, upgrading it. We know the company has got, uh, we can, we'll talk about this in key points, the space for expansion um, in, the, in the production facility. So spending money, how that should be uh, accounted for in the financial statements, capital expenditure being uh, capitalized as costs, but which ones are expenditures to be expensed in the period. Leasing machinery, we know the company leases um, uh, at an increasing rate and they also have been selling off some of their machinery. So leasing is becoming more and more important. It's one of the newer standards to be released. It's not new anymore, it's been around a good few years, IFRS uh, 16, but uh, in this syllabus it's all about leasing from the perspective of the less E. Uh, that's the person taking out the lease. So knowing how leasing works, the right of use asset, the lease liability, how that is calculated and um, accounted for. So calculations aren't necessarily going to be required, but understanding the underlying accounting techniques and requirements, that's the key thing. Any revaluation of existing assets uh, for whatever reason and revaluation potentially because of impairment too. Uh, valuation of inventory, that could be uh, one particularly if it's inventory that's been damaged or is obsolete, needs to be uh, reduced in value, maybe we need to change its value from cost to NRV or vice versa. Also tax and lots of these will have a tax element so you'll specifically maybe be recording the purchase of a new asset and you'll need to maybe go th all the way through to talking about the implications for tax and in that case it would be capital allowances adding back your accounting depreciation deducting your tax depreciation we know tax to depreciation is 25 percent on a reducing balance basis with a full amount that can be recorded in the year of purchase that's in the last page of the pre-scene don't worry you can refer back to the pre-scene in the exam but knowing things like that on the top of your head from the top of your head going to help to uh, answer questions more quickly so lots of ways that this can come up so the key points to raise these are the things that you need to do if you get a financial reporting question so first of all you need to know the uh, which standard is being referred to sometimes it will be specifically explicitly referred to in the question you'll be asked to apply the provisions of IAS2 inventory or IFRS 16 leases or does this asset count as um, uh, held for sale according to uh, IFRS 5? I think that one is, isn't it? Um, so you need to know which one is which and then you need to, um, you need to apply the uh, provisions of that statement. Okay. Typically, you're talking about the accounting requirements. You're talking about the impact on the financial statement. So once this has been accounted for, once we've set this lease up for this machinery, once we've um, account, accounted for the expenditure on upgrading this asset once we've spent the money on uh, developing this production facility. It's not just the bookkeeping, it's what does that do to the financial statements, what does that do to our assets, liabilities, what does that mean for profits, what does that mean for tax. That's usually how that's framed. Make sure you read the question carefully. Finally, you need to know your debits and credits. Calculations, not necessarily going to be required. You won't have to do the complicated calculations of the uh, present value of the future lease payments and doing all the you know implied interest rate all that kind of stuff that's an f1 question this is ocs what you need to do is explain the underlying accounting so you need to know your debits and your credits you need to know how all of that works which account is being credited with what which account is being debited with what to make it all balance okay so relevant theory to be honest 
Um, it's it's kind of any of the financial reporting standards from F1. These are the ones that we see come up again and again. Okay, uh, IS16 expenditure, uh, you know, investing in new property, plant, and equipment, or depreciating it, or disposing of it, um, impairment, etc. IFRS5 for disposals or discontinued operations. IFRS16 for leases. IS2 for inventory. Um, and then some of the tax stuff as well. So tax wouldn't be based on, uh, well, your IS12 to, uh, for income tax, um, capital allowances on assets, uh, as we talked about as well. So for your tax depreciation. Another one is IAS10 events after the reporting period uh, and knowing what is an adjusting and a non-adjusting event. So these are the key ones. We see these come up again and again. So um, highly recommend um, going back and revising some of these if you have forgotten the, the core ideas behind them. Okay, next up, number nine, variance analysis. So again, this is another big uh, P1 topic that is frequently examined. Again, you don't really see a variant where there isn't variance analysis. So... Um, yeah, pretty much always, always comes up. And there's all that budget information and the cost card given in the pre-scene. So there's lots of data already there and information there that can be used as a basis for a question. It's also very easy for examiners to put reference material in there where it's actual resu results versus budgeted results, um, or they'll give you some variance details, whatever it might be. So certainly an important topic always likely to come up so how does it apply how is it examined typically um, in the OCS okay so it's looking at things like analyzing your sales volume and price variances to determine uh, impact on revenue or it could be something like investigating direct material or labor variances that affect cost of sales identifying underlying causes of variances so underperformance market conditions internal efficiencies looking at did the cost go up for this particular material was the direct labor cost higher because of uh, inefficiencies um, did uh, increased overtime push the cost up of this product were the number of units predicted lower than expected because our forecasts or our market research wasn't good enough etc so all the classic variance analysis stuff so the way to or the things the points to raise um, and the way you answer these questions when it comes to things like sales variances okay that could be linked to lower sales volumes or it could be pricing pressures in the market so and with this you do need to bring your knowledge of the company into it so we know we've got a premium product okay premium backpack back at a high price point so that needs to feed into our variance analysis and if we launch a new product for example which is be which is planned four new products on the agenda for release next year if one of those sales don't go as well as we think it could be a pricing issue um, that we, we, the price is too high um, that could lead to lower sales uh, it, but it could be other things too cost variances might be due to higher material costs or labor inefficiencies I've kind of just talked about those points possibly linked to supply chain issues so all three of those things again need to be applied specifically to back office so higher material costs could happen we know we've got a couple of, of our key raw materials like ballistic nylon that is a single supplier that provides that to us so if anything happens there if they can't meet the demand um, if they have to increase their prices they get a new client and they can charge a higher price to them and so we become less of a priority all of those things um, will affect the the cost of uh, raw materials labor inefficiencies as i mentioned before we are uh, looking at launching four new product lines in various stages of development some of them are ready to go some of them are a little bit far away but if there are new products with new raw materials new processes new machines new skills needed of staff that's probably going to impact labor possibly linked to supply chain issues as well so um, could be rather than just the fact that we're reliant on a single supplier it could be just a bigger a broader problem in the supply chain um, one of our raw materials is cotton or cotton fleece 
So if there's a bad harvest or if cotton supply drops or the price sheets up for whatever reason, um, that, that, could, uh, that could reverberate around the supply chain. Fixed overhead variances, operational inefficiencies in the manufacturing process that could be contributing to unfavorable variances. Okay, so the relevant theory here, obviously, from P1, your variance analysis chapters. So going through all of those again, if it's been a while. Key ones here, material price and usage variances, labor rates and efficiency variances, fixed overhead expenditure, volume capacity and efficiency variances, sales price and volume variances, forecasting uh, it's to some extent relevant here and budgeting too. But really knowing your variances, knowing how to analyze your variances and what to do if you've got adverse uh, variances, um, very, very common exam question. Our final clip is from our mini mock debrief video. We produce a range of mock exams for each sitting and alongside each of those mocks is a video debrief. And in these debrief videos, our experienced tutor analyzes every question and takes you through a step-by-step -step guide on the best way to approach them. And by watching debrief videos, you'll learn to understand how to pick out all of the key information in the task and the requirements. You'll use that information to build an effective plan. Many students fail due to poor answer planning. And then that will help you to formulate an excellent answer. So in our sample video, we'll take you through question one of the mini mock. So here we are. This is the mini mock. Half the regular size, half the size of a regular full mock. Okay, so there's just two tasks here, 45 minutes each. So uh, just to give you a taster of what the exam is like, how it works, uh, the question style, the reference material, all the other aspects are the same. It's just on a smaller scale. So task one is 45 minutes in this case. The tasks are always 45 minutes, whether it's a mini mock or whether it's the real exam. What we do first, before we start reading through all of this material here, the best advice we find is to just skip down. We'll come back to this. We're going to go through all of this. But what we want to do first is just look at the breakdown. So we're looking at the percentages assigned and how many subtasks do we have. So we have one, two, three subtasks. So we know that in that 45 minutes, we've got to apportion our times and estimate the apportioned marks to three different subtasks so rather than thinking of it as a single 45 minute chunk actually we're probably thinking of this as closer to well almost three 15 minute chunks but actually if we're going to be more specific um, we'd have a little bit more time for task b so uh, time pressure is real in this exam and it's important to know how much time to spend don't go straight into reading this start writing for subtask a you realize you're 20 25 minutes in you spent way too long on task subtask a okay so in terms of marks and time to spend this percentage is given you to given to you by SEMA to give you an idea of how much time to spend but you can also use it to get a rough idea of the mark allocation so the little shortcut is you take the percentage and obviously this works for 45 minute questions. It has to be a 45 minute question. If it's an hour long question, it'll change slightly. 32% um, in terms of marks. If you divide that 32, if you divide that percentage by four, it's going to give you a pretty good approximation of how many marks are available. So 32 divided by four, that gives you eight marks. And to get from marks to minutes, you basically double it and subtract two. Um, you might have to do a little bit of rounding to make it all add up, but that's roughly what we're doing. So we're doing 34, uh, sorry, 32 divided by four. That gives you eight marks, eight marks, double it, 16 minus two, 14 minutes. Do the same thing here, 36%, divide it by four. That's going to give you nine. Double nine is 18 minus two, 16 minutes. Okay, this is a quick, quick and rough way to do it. And then finally, 32%. That should be the same as this, but the minutes don't add up. It's not an exact science, it's rough. So we've got eight minutes and then we've doubled it would be 14. We've got a minute left over, so we can either chuck that extra minute in here or we can give ourselves a minute at the end to just check through our questions. It's up to you what you wanna do with that extra minute. So now we know the structure, what we're gonna do is start going through the requirement lines. 
so we know what it is that we have to do and then we'll go back and read the information to help us build up our plan but this we're already starting to structure a plan so when you're on your blank page you should already have basically three headings or three spaces where you're going to develop three different uh, sections in the plan so let's first of all look at uh you can they're usually written in bullet points for the ocs so you can identify it by the bullet point but it's whatever comes directly before the subtask weighting percentage so in this case we are to write a report that covers and what we are doing is assess so paying attention to the verb assess means something different to describe assess means to kind of uh, as well not to analyze but to, to assess we know what assess means describing something isn't the same as assessing analyzing evaluation that's a slightly different verb as well so we're assessing looking at here the advantages and the disadvantages of adopting a participative approach to budgeting at back office and explain whether or not it would be suitable so again, we're just thinking about structure here and obviously I'm taking longer because I'm explaining everything as I'm going through it. You would do this very, very quickly in a real exam. But what we're doing here is uh, we're, we can break this down into two or into three areas in the following way. Okay, so we're given quite specific things to do here. First of all, advantages. Then we're going to look at the disadvantages. And then finally, and don't forget to do this, do look out for this in questions. You've got to explain whether or not it would be suitable. If you didn't do that, you're throwing away marks. So don't forget to do those little things that you've been asked to do at the end. So we're looking at eight marks. There's three sections here. So what should we do? Let's say for suitability, first of all, we'll probably say there's two marks there and that leaves six marks. So we're probably looking at getting three advantages and three disadvantages. There we go. Structure sorted for task A. Uh, subtask A. So what we need to do now, now we've got the structure, is figure out what it is, what we're going to write about. We've already got a bit of an idea, okay, already a participative approach to budgeting. There are some general advantages and disadvantages that could apply here. The suitability might be a bit more particular and specific. But let's have a look now uh, around just before the subtask, before the requirement line to see what it is, get a bit more context. So you've come into work, you find the following email from the finance manager. I've been looking into our budgeting approach following a recent management meeting. Now we should know from the pre-scene that the budgeting approach at back office is incremental budgeting. Incremental budgeting is where you take the previous year's budget and you make a few adjustments, you adjust it upwards or downwards, but basically the, your starting point is what happened last year. Lots very commonly used, um, simple, but there's some flaws with that approach and what we we might need to do is talk about how a participative approach might overcome some of those flaws. So um, we had a recent management meeting about discrepancies between actual and budgeted figures over the last two financial years. See reference material. We'll do that in a minute. Let's just see what else is in here that's relevant. We've been using the same budgeting approach for years, although we've been through some significant operational changes during this time so the company has changed but we're using the same old approach and that is potentially leading to issues where our actual and budgeted figures have discrepancies and we're looking to explain how participative approach to budgeting is going to fix this the things that we've been doing that have seen the changes we've uh, had an expansion of our product line so introducing new products obviously that's going to introduce new production um, production lines, processes, product costings, and budgets for those product lines. And so if we're using an old approach, that, that might be a problem. We've also got an increased focus on sustainability. Sustainability means uh, ethical sourcing in supply chain, okay? And that obviously can come at a bigger cost. So again, these all impact how you put your budget together. So I'm reviewing our approach to assess whether it's our best option going forwards. Got a pretty good idea of what we need to do here. Let's just have a look at the reference material to see what else we need to do. Okay, so the reference material here are actual versus budgeted figures for the year end. And we've got budgeted versus actual, and we've got some notes. So we're looking at sales revenue, cost of sales, and gross profit. And we can see the budgeted amounts here. 
uh, just over 18 million, nearly 9 million for costs, with a gross profit of nearly 9 million. Now, look at what we've got here. Sales revenue, actual versus budgeted. Is it better or worse? It's worse, it's lower by over 500,000. So that is down on where we want it to be. Let's look at cost of sales. Let's compare that. Well, cost of sales is higher, uh, which means more costs by almost 200,000. Okay, so that is gone in the wrong direction too. What's the impact been on gross profit? Well, with less revenue and more costs, that's led to actually a big old drop off in gross profit. So we've gone down here by quite a lot. How much has it gone down? What's that? Um, six, six or seven hundred, something like that. Um, what would that be? 550, uh, 657, yeah, about 700,000. Just quick maths there. Um, so the, the combined impact of those two, uh, big drop off in gross profit. Let's look at these other figures. Okay, so what we see here is that uh, we've got percentages. So revenue was nearly 3% lower, 2% uh, increase in cost of sale. But those two together leads to a almost 8% decrease in gross profit. And looking, we know that around... Uh, profits are around about 50%, the gross margin on most of our products, the average gross gross margin. So a decline of 7%, that's bringing it down then to you know the low 40s. That's quite a big uh, drop. So um, the cost of sales could be rising material costs, um, in which case, you know, uh, again, relating this back to budgeting, okay, in the budgeting process, a participative approach might have caught that because they would have included... Uh, in participative uh, costing you might have included someone from the production department who would be maybe know that material costs are going up and that would have been included in the budget so that would have led to budgeted being more accurate the significant variance suggests we need to reassess budgeting to capture operational complexities especially as it expands product lines and enters new markets. So this is the information. These are the problems we've got to try and solve. I think that's what we can do. So if we go back now, just to recap, so we've got advantages, two advantages so of a participative approach. So I've already mentioned one. Um, you're going to get better accuracy because you've got expertise coming from uh, people from various departments. We look at the disadvantages. Finally, we want to assess the suitability. So would participative approach to budgeting actually solve the problems that we're seeing here so would it lead to fewer discrepancies and um, would it lead to more accurate budgeting so let's take all that then and put it together in our plan okay so this is our plan for the two tasks and yes in the real exam you should be doing something similar to this we've got our three tasks we'll go to the other ones in a minute let's just look at our first subtask on participative budgeting in terms of planning we've just got a couple of minutes to do this two and a half minutes so first of all what is participative budgeting it's the process where employees across different departments and levels of the organization are involved in the preparation of budgets so unlike top-down budgeting where senior management sets the budget with limited input from employees, participative budgeting encourages collaboration and input from various functions. So the advantages then of that approach for first of all, one key advantage is that it can lead to more accurate budget forecasts by involving department heads such as those from sales and marketing and production and procurement. Back office can gain better insights into the actual costs and revenue drivers for its different product lines. For example, the production director might have better knowledge of the true material costs for backpacks, which would have helped with getting a more accurate budget uh, because we saw the costs were much higher. And if those costs were because of um, raw material costs, that is something they might have seen. The sales director might have had a better sales forecast based on market conditions. So we saw lower revenue. If lower revenue was because there wasn't the demand, then that's something that the sales director could have contributed. Another advantage is increased ownership and motivation. So when department managers, when they contribute to the budget setting process, they are more likely to feel a sense of responsibility for meeting the targets that they help to set. That could be beneficial at back office. So you might get the research and development team. They've faced challenges with recent launches, giving them a voice in budgeting that could give them a commitment to meeting 
financial and operational goals and that will help them to stay on budget and, and meet product, product development or product development costs. It also, it's going to get you better cross-departmental communication. It encourages communication between different departments. And because we've got those different departments, particularly between uh, research and development and the manufacturing and production department, but also finance, marketing, having that uh, sort of communication between those departments as the budget is being put together, that can avoid miscommunication and it can prove, improve overall budget accuracy and that at the end of the day is what we want to try and do by introducing participative budgeting in this case trying to get it so that actual results are more closely aligned with budgeted results now the downsides or the disadvantages is that of course it is time consuming and complex you've got more people involved uh, there's going to be more stages of development it is bottom up what you might call a bottom up approach so it might go through many phases and revisions before it gets signed off and you might get more disagreements although more on that in a moment there is a potential for budgetary slack okay so that's where managers deliberately understate revenue projections or overstate cost estimates to make their targets easier to achieve so you have to be careful of that and then it can lead to conflict between departments so the downside or the other side of improved communication is that Every department is going to want, you know, more money or more, um, you know, more in the budget for their department. And there might be conflict over certain decisions about what's available in the budget for those different um, departments. And you really don't want departments sort of fighting with each other over budgets. Um, and that, that's going to lead to more more problems in, uh, in the long term. So. The last thing we had to talk about was suitability. So. Um, you might have a different uh, stance on suitability. This is the approach we're going for. So in the context of this company where we are expanding into new markets, as we as we learned later in the question, um, and we're introducing new product lines, um, that's going to introduce operational complexity, new product lines, new manufacturing, potentially expanding our manufacturing facility. And so there's lots of arguments to suggest that participative budgeting really could help and participative budgeting might have also helped with the failed product launch from the previous year. So overall, there does seem to be a lot to suggest that this approach would help. However, we have to acknowledge the downsides here, the disadvantages. Time consuming and complex probably isn't such a big deal um, for a company like this where there's a long um, sort, of, sort of development period. Budgetary slack, that could could be a bit of an issue, but hopefully the increased ownership motivation would overcome that. The conflict between departments, that could be the issue. So that increasing um, the, the chance of conflict and how long it takes, that's those are things to do with its bottom down, bottom up nature. So if we could kind of balance it with a top down approach, we get maybe one level of participa participation, but ultimate sign off comes from the finance department or whoever signs it off maybe an approach like that would get the best of both worlds that's what we're going with um you might have had a different outcome but that's fine as long as you argue for that point so there we have it five key videos to get you started with your exam preparation i hope you found them useful but the reality is that this is just a starting point and you'll need to do a lot more preparation over the next few weeks to improve your chances of passing this tricky exam. And to that end, we have a number of options available. The video clips you've just seen are taken from our course content. And our courses are designed to help you ultimately pass the exam. We want to minimize your study time. And of course, we want to ensure that you're getting your value for your money. So if you want more of what you saw today, you want to check out our full pre-scene analysis pack. And that basically includes the full videos from which those clips were taken, from the pre-scene analysis videos through to the top 10 analysis, the strategic analysis, industry analysis. And in addition to that, we've also got 30 pre-scene questions that are designed to help you consolidate your knowledge and understanding of the pre-scene company. 
Pre-scene analysis is a crucial first step, but passing the exam requires developing your exam technique and lots and lots of practice. So the best all-round comprehensive solution is the Astranti Premium SCS course. On that, in addition to everything you get in the pre-scene analysis pack, you'll also get five mock exams. And those mock exams are written according to the pre-scene company. They're not generic and they don't have generic solutions. They're applied to the pre-scene and they're based on the top 10 issues. So you'll get questions in the mock exam that they'll have a good chance of coming up in the real exam. In addition to those mock exams, you can get mock marking and feedback. And this is where you'll submit a mock exam to your dedicated marker and they will mark that and give you a fully annotated script with feedback and annotations. And they also provide a nine page document with feedback that you can apply in your next mock. In addition to that, we've got our exam technique video series. Exam technique is really important in this exam. And so our exam technique video series has 13 chapter study texts and accompanying videos taking you through every aspect of exam technique, right from understanding the exam through to interpreting the requirements, answer planning, writing technique, and time management. Really valuable course that will help you a lot developing those soft skills that you need to do well in this exam. Alongside that, we have three live masterclasses that run throughout the course from the first one that's looking at the pre-scene through to later ones that look more at exam technique and theory revision to help you get ready. Included in the premium, you get access to tutor and mentor support, and you'll be able to access our discussion hub where you can post your questions and talk with other students and tutors about any questions and queries you may have. And our premium course comes with our double pass guarantee, and that's exclusive to premium course students. It's a double guarantee because if you don't pass, if you take this course and you don't pass the exam, We'll give it you again for free with no extra charge and you also have a 14 day money back guarantee so if after 14 days on the course you're not happy you can get a refund no questions asked so whatever your situation we believe we have the solution for you at astranti and you can find out more at astranti.com slash thanks for watching